Hi, this is going to be a video I record on my Android because I'm kind of too sick to stand up about how the meter works because I'm too sick, okay? So, like, I've got to transfer the knowledge I've got to somebody and I don't know who God's going to hire so I just have to scattershot it out there and see who picks it up, all right? In this case, our object of study is going to be the meter in, this is Matthew, let's see if I can get this, there we go, Matthew 24, 25, all right, about Russia, because it's newly, I, I newly understand what kind of story Matthew 24, which is talking about everybody, but in each country's case, you have to go to each country's history to see how its words that are in this text you see on screen, how its words apply to that given country. All right, because, and, and let me, uh, I'm probably saying this in the wrong order. Let me start over. The whole purpose of New Testament prophecy is not to tell you when the rapture is, but to tell you what time it is if you're still on earth. You don't need to know when the rapture happens because when the rapture happens, you're not going to be here. All right? So you don't need prophecy for when you're not here. You only need prophecy for when you are here. So just all prophecies like that. In other words, why give somebody prophecy about the future? Because they're going to live in it. I don't need prophecy about the past except to know that it got fulfilled so that I know the way God, God says a thing so that I know how to read it from my own time and in the future. You get that? We have to know what God said in the past that got fulfilled so we know how he talks because we're going to have to know what time it is. Just like Israel was always supposed to know what time it was. Every single year is mapped in the Bible. I'm not kidding. Scholars don't know this because they're really bad at math. They screwed up Daniel 9 and everybody's been in the dark ever since. When Daniel says 490 years, why does he pick that number? Nobody even bothered to ask. Okay, why did Daniel pick, or God pick, why did God pick 490 years when he replies to Daniel? Daniel doesn't even ask him what that number means, which means Daniel already knew. Well, if Daniel already knew what 490 was, then somehow the Bible's been talking about it for a very long time. Okay, yeah, it does. All of the Bible dates are based on the 490. The 490 is a grant of time. It is a default grant of time. 490 plus 70 plus 490 equals 1050, which we truncate to 1,000. All right, because the last 50 years is for evangelism to get people to be saved. All right? So those numbers are all in the Bible, but we don't see how well they're organized. All right. Well, one of the organization mechanisms that God uses is what you see on screen. Every single word in the Bible is metered. The seven meter relates to time, you know, seven days in a week. All right. So by the time you get to the New Testament, God is still metering time because we still have to know what time it is. But we don't have to know what time it is if we're not here. We only need to know what time it is if we are here. So we get prophecy about the tribulation because there will be people who are here then. We got prophecy about the Old Testament because there are people who were there then. So if it's past, you learn how God explains it. If it's future, you take what God explained before and you apply all the same principles to the explanation you get now about a future you do not know. But you're going to be in it. So you have to learn it. All right. Sorry for the side trip, but that's what we're doing with this. So now what I'm basically doing is verifying how God talked about past, 
with respect to church after 30 AD when Christ died. That's what this Matthew passage is. And there are other New Testament books that do the same thing. There are at least six chapters we've found so far that literally craft an annual schedule for church so church can know while she's down here what time it is. All right. So for the Russian church, all right, or really it's not Russia, but Ukraine, what time is it in any given year? And if you were living in China, you'd be looking at the same text to find out what time it is for China. Okay. And I'll be covering that in future videos. Right now, I want you to understand we are testing what Matthew says in light of Russian history. So what I'm going to do is I take this text. It's in Greek, but I'll translate it for you. Okay, you can follow along in English. And then these are the years, this last column. You add 30 to it in order to get AD. And then we're just going to basically look up what AD and then see what the text says and then see how it applies to Russia or Ukraine, really, most of the time. Okay? Now, that's really important to talk about Ukraine-Russia because it's a major theme of Bible in the main topic of prophecy in the New Testament is about how church, literally, literally church, becomes the Antichrist. You won't hear that said in pulpits. They sort of mask some aspects of this story. They say, oh, the Catholic Church is the Antichrist. Well, it's really not the Catholic Church, but it is the church. Which part of church, which is all the believers, which part of us is going to become the Antichrist? The Antichrist comes from Christians. The major doctrine in the New Testament that nobody covers. The text is real bald about it, bald enough so that for 500 years, everybody's been looking at the Vatican and saying they're the ones who are going to be the Antichrist. Okay, but that's not what the text says. The text says it's Christian. The question is where Christian? It's not restricted to the Vatican. In fact, the Vatican really doesn't even count because the Vatican is a place not a person. All right? So all those Christians that we've been hearing, including my own pastor taught this, oh, it's the Catholic Church who's going to be the Antichrist in the future. Calvin started that 500 years ago. It's like nobody reads the prophecy. The prophecy's in Daniel 11. It's a guy, a person who's a Gentile who lines up with an antichrist who's a Jew, and between them they make the pact. That's Daniel 9, 27. And that's what brings, you know, the tribulation to a close. They do it at the mid-trib. Okay, but they both are alive prior. They both have a lifetime prior. They both have a background prior. And so what is that? The other thing you need to know is because the rapture is not predicted, Satan's always trying to make this happen in every generation. So in our generation, who's he trying to make it happen with? Well, the obvious answer is Trump and Putin, which, you know, I've covered in prior videos. In this one, we're looking at the Russia side because I didn't know enough about Russia. All right, so I've, I've spent a lot of time introducing this. I think I'll cut this video and then we'll go on to the next increment. Hi, now we're in Russ 2. And I'm going to show you the methodology for looking up a particular period of history to see what the Bible says about it. This is something that you won't find anywhere else because the scholars don't know about it. And it's a long story, but basically I learned about it in 2008. And when I found out about it, I quickly began to learn that the scripture has its own rules and patterns. I began to find out what those were. And then I started applying those rules to different passages to see what, what happened. 
And that's how come this thing is really quite sophisticated. But at the same time, um, if you're like 12 or 13 years old, you could do this. All right. I don't recommend you do this as a child. I recommend that you go to your parents if you're under the age of 18, because there you have the right to tell you what you should and shouldn't look at. Okay. But presuming that you're over 18, then this is going to be useful. Okay. So here, let's start. We're going to look up in Matthew, this guy, Ivan Kalita. Kalita means money bags. You'll notice at the very top line that the words that you see there are in Russian because I'm using Russian Wikipedia. If you use Chrome, because that's the browser you see on screen, if you use Chrome, it will automatically translate the page to English if you use Chrome. That's what I've done. My Russian is um, very, very limited. I didn't learn it when I could have. So that's what I'm using first. I'm first looking at Russian Wikipedia because when Russians talk about their own history, which there's a lot of dispute about their history, when they talk about it, they frequently use this. All right. In other words, Russians are arguing with Russians. Ukrainians are arguing with Russians back and forth and they write up articles here. So it's not going to have the same data as you'll find in English Wikipedia. Okay. So here's how we're going to play. I want you to just, you don't have to agree with what I'm going to say. I just want you to see how it's done. Okay. So that way you can do it yourself. All right. We're going to look up this guy, Ivan Danilovich Kalida. Okay. Kalida means money bags. And that, that's one of the disputed points. You'll notice that he was presumably born the 1st of November, 1288, and he died in March, 1340. Why am I looking this guy up? Because the Bible prophecy uses people. It's always tracking people. The Bible prophecy in the New Testament is specifically tracking, this is really important, it's tracking, let's see if I can show you. Hold on. Remember that date, 1288 to 1340. Bible prophecy is specifically tracking, see here's Matthew 24, 25. It's specifically tracking rulers, the secular rules, rulers, compared to Christians. See, the biggest doctrine in the Bible is that Christ buys the whole universe. Okay, the all of creation would not exist if he didn't already, in eternity past, agree to go to the cross, to take on humanity and go to the cross. That's Isaiah 53. The real decree is Isaiah 53. It's not what they teach you in seminary. It's not what they say in the pulpits. It's, it's astonishing to me just how bad Bible teaching is. All right, Isaiah 53 is the divine decree. Okay. Hine yaskil abdi yarum in my badly pronounced Hebrew. Hebrew. Hine, look, be on the alert. Yaskil abdi yarum by meaning by means of his truth knowledge skill. My slave son will be raised on high, exalted. Okay, that's how. Isaiah 53 opens, but it's not in our Bibles as Isaiah 53. It's in our Bibles as Isaiah 52, 13. Okay. See, the Hebrew has a different chapter marking than we use. That's why I don't use English except as a reference point. Okay. So the purpose of history is Christ. So all that crap they talk about in seminary about infralapsarianism or superlapsarianism or sublapsarianism as some kind of guidance for how God did his decree. Throw them all out. They're too damn dumb to live. I swear Bible scholars are so incompetent. It's not funny. 
they're confident that certain basic things like you know how words are used beyond that when it comes to the theology their incompetence is staggering absolutely staggering look at isaiah 53 starting at 52 13 ending at 53 12 in our bibles that's god's decree and isaiah did what you see here in the greek he did it in hebrew let's see if i can show you all right let's see if i can i can get this because you'll, you'll you'll not understand this until you you know play with it and i don't want you to just believe me because i say so okay um let's see where do i go with this Here we go. This is Isaiah 53. See, it starts at 52.13. I made it look like candlesticks. Okay? Using the column feature in Microsoft Word. Alright? I made it look like candlesticks. That's Isaiah 53. It's metered. And when it starts up here at 59.13, see if I can get it bigger so you can see it. it starts up here at 59.13. So that's the text I was saying. Hine yaskil avdi yarum. Right there at that first, that first line. That was the text I was saying in my horrible Hebrew accent. All right. This is all metered for time. So that covers nine years. From when? From when David was born. David died at age 77. So you'll notice that the first time the text sevens is at 42. The second time is 35. The sum is 77. And this is how Matthew and Luke mapped the genealogies. Matthew uses the 42 and Luke uses 35 to come up with the 77th son. See where they got it from? This is where they got it from. Isaiah 53. Meter. From the meter. Which scholars don't know anything about. Because people are always saying, Well, how come they got those genealogies? They don't make any sense. Yeah, they do, but nobody's studying them. Okay? This is one of the reasons why you can prove they make sense. This is how you can prove where they got their style from. Okay? This, from 52.13, all the way to the end of it, ah, okay, right down here, see in the lower right-hand corner where it says 50, 54, one you'll see that just above that is the number 462, see? That's the end of Isaiah 53. 462 plus 28 is 490. And what have you heard of 490 before? Daniel 9! Ding, 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 ding. So what is this telling you? It's divisible by 7. So what else is it telling you? It's a timeline. Now the Jews knew this easily. We don't. The Jews have forgotten it by now. All right, so this is a timeline from David's birth up here and 462, which is leaving some of it in ellipsis, okay, 462 is divisible by 7. So Isaiah is doing a timeline from what? First David's birth to last David's death. Okay, but there's more than 462 years between the two. Yeah. So what? Wh what's left out? Yeah, good question. All right, and in the videos on Isaiah, I ex I answer that question. But you you see how obvious it is that it's a timeline. Okay, so what happened to the brains here? This particular thing you're looking at in 1752, a guy named Robert Loth was doing the same thing I'm telling you, and he couldn't figure it out because it's Hebrew, so it ought to follow Greek language rules. Really? Since when should Hebrew follow Greek 
language rules. And because he made that mistake, all the scholars after him made the same mistake, and nobody knows that this is metered until now. I learned it was metered in 2008. Why didn't they? For 500 frickin' years. Because they're listening to the, each other instead of looking at Bible. All right, commercial message over. Now if I can. Come on. How do I get? There we go. Thank you. So, when we come to Matthew, it's the same idea. It's a timeline because it's divisible by seven at the end. The syllable counts are divisible by seven at the end. So it's a timeline. What kind of timeline is it? The timeline for church. And about what? People, as I started to tell you before. Secular rulers. That's why we're looking up Ivan Kalita and Christians. Because that the pattern of history is determined by who rules. Okay, but the Christian rules underneath Christ. For whom all creation, Isaiah 53, which you just saw, all creation was made for Christ. Because he's going to buy it. And then he's going to, as it were, we're all going to have the privilege of throwing ourselves down for Father. We're going to want to do that because he's so gorgeous. Once you really know God, that's all you want to do. But he doesn't want you to sacrifice. But you want to sacrifice. Christ wanted to go to the cross. He even said so. I yearn for the cross. Look up yearn and cross in the Bible. He yearned for it. Well, he doesn't say the word cross. Yearn. Look, look at Christ saying he yearned for this day. All right, that's where you'll find it. How can? Why would you yearn for a cross? Why would you yearn to suffer? Because you love somebody so much. Because you enjoy them so much. Because you need an outlet to thank them. And once you see God in heaven, that's what you're going to want. So you get that now. You are on earth as a ruler. It's a burden. You will be held accountable for how you rule down here. So you're ruling and the pagan or not pagan or just secular rulers are here. And this traces the two. It traces when church is salty or saltless, with doctrine or without. It traces the secular rulers as well because that's how we mark time. All right, so Ivan Kalita's time was 1288, remember? Ivan Kalita's time was 1288, there we go. November 1, 1288 to March 31, 1340. So we're going to look that up and see what the text says about that time for him, about him. All right, and you, you apply this individually per country. Now we're looking at him. So we go here in this second column where it says cum. All right, we're looking for, remember you add 30. So he was, he started, he was born 1288. And just here, fourth from the bottom, you see in purple letters, purple color, 1257. That means 1287 A.D. Okay? So that is 1, 2, 3, 4 from the bottom. Come on. I have to wait for this X. Oh, I really don't like the way that works. Okay, so 4 from the bottom. So the bottom and the lower left-hand corner is Greek word hutas. Just above it is the Greek word kai. Just above it is the Greek word akri. And just above it is, the, is another chi. All right. So the year that's ending at 1287. One, two, three, four. Is the Greek word gamizontas. Okay. And marrying and giving in marriage. Okay. So now if you go look it up in your English. 
That's Matthew 20, 4, 38. And he's, the context is what? The end times. That it's going to hit suddenly and everybody's living a normal life. So it's not now. All right. Everybody's living a normal life. In the true, you know, everybody's trying to say, when is the tribulation going to start? You won't know. It's not going to, if, if times look bad and you say to yourself, oh, surely the tribulation is coming soon, then it's not coming. If you're busy, like this verse is saying, okay, uh, Matt, the last clause in Matthew 24, 38 is saying, um, and they were drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Okay, the last, second to the last clause in Matthew 24, 38. In other words, they were drinking and having a good time. They were marrying and giving in marriage, daily, you know, festivities, celebrations. Okay, and then the last clause in Matthew 24, 38, so you can find it in your English, until the days that Noah got into the boat. In other words, he's drawing an analogy between a past period of history and current, which is exactly how you learn to read prophecy by that parallelism. Bible's always doing parallels. And he's saying, look, the final days that are really going to be the final days, you won't think that they're final. Everything's going to be normal until the day that Noah got in the boat. In other words, there was nothing to tell you that the rain was going to start. There was nothing to tell you that the end was instant. No warning. In Noah's case, he was the warner. He had 120 years to tell everybody, hi, you don't want God, so guess what? You're not going to get him. And it's going to be so bad, you guys are all so bad, that animals are walking from thousands of miles away to come to me and get in this boat, which it doesn't have to be the animals getting in this boat. It could be you, but you don't want to come into this boat. So it's going to be the animals. They're smarter than you. 120 years, that was the message. And they laughed at him. Meanwhile, all these animals, because you know it would take them 120 years. To walk from wherever they were to finally get to where Noah was. And that means that, you know, their parents, 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 parents. So maybe 10 or 20 generations back, some giraffe coming up, if they had giraffes then. Some giraffe coming up from lower Africa was coming up to Noah's boat. But it wouldn't be the giraffe that started. It would be like 10 generations later because how long does it take to walk from where that giraffe was? to Noah's boat. Okay, so the only sign that people had that the end was coming was the stream of animals. All right. And it could have been the people who were streaming into the boat, but they didn't want that. So they were laughing at him and they were drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Okay, which is Matthew 24, 38. And our verse that we're looking at for Kalita is at the word giving in marriage. That ends it at 1287. See, it says right here, fourth from the bottom, it says 1257. At 30, that's 1287 AD. So now the next line, 1288, the year he's born. The last clause in Matthew 12 38 says Akri. Akri is Greek for until. Until. So the year he's born is an until. Which means what? This guy is the hiatus. This guy is the changeover guy. You get, you get that meaning? The word until is saying that something was X and now... It's going to become Y. So Kalida is the changeover guy. Because it's taking the year he's born, 1288, and marking it with the word Akri. 
which means until. Now, it just so happens that that's historically true. And I'll cover more about that in the next increment. Now we're back in Rust 3, and we're now going through how do we read the Bible meter in Matthew 24, which is right here. See, here's Matthew 24. How do we read it for this guy? I really don't like the way Zoto works. How do we read it for this guy? Ivan Danilovich Kalita. Period is from 1288 to 1340. And we terminated the last increment by starting with his birth year, which is right up here. Ultimate last clause in uh, Matthew 24, 38. Greek word is akri, and it means until. So if you open up your English Bibles and you look up the word until in Matthew 24, 38, you're at the same place that I am in when I'm talking. All right. That is the very first word in this clause, which is now three from the bottom. And the first word, therefore, is the next year. So instead of being 1257 plus 30 equals 1287, it's 1288. At this Greek word, akri, meaning until. And again, the translation of this clause that you will have in your English is until the days that Noah went into the boat. The last word there, kiboton, means boat which means that at the end, at the very end, 1273 is in the, in the, is the number. You add 30, that's 1303 AD. That means that there's some kind of cataclysm that's going to start just after 1303 AD. That's what the text is telling you. Now, our boy, Ivan, was born 1288. 1288 and 12 means he was 12 years old. All right. By 1303, that's three more years from 2000. Well, you can even say four. So 12 plus four, he's 16. Okay. So the text is marking off the time of his own life and making an important statement of some kind. We don't know yet what. About 1303, when he was 16, 1516. Now that matters a lot because this is written in Greek, but it's written to people under the Roman Empire. And 15 was a very important year in the Roman Empire. And, you know, you're supposed to interpret the Bible the way it was written in the culture it was written at the time. And then you try to find cultural equivalents today in order for people today to understand it. Well, the only culture today that makes an issue of age 15 is Mexico. Your 15th birthday is a big deal in Mexico. It was a big deal in ancient Rome. In ancient Rome, you were considered to be a man at age 15. You got what was called the toga virilis, which is this big, heavy, ugly, in uncomfortable thing that you had draped in a specific way about your body to show that you were a patrician. And that was toga means this ugly, floppy, big piece of cloth that's draped specially around you. It takes four people to put it on you. And then virilis means of man. You are now manhood. You are now a man. In Jewish custom, it's age 12 for male or female. Okay, like I, I had a bat mitzvah when I was 12. Okay. In, in, he, in, um, Roman culture, which is, you gotta interpret Matthew in light of Roman culture, even though it's written in Greek, that was the 15th birthday. So they're making, the Bible's making an important statement about this guy at his 15th birthday, which is his 16th year. 
Okay? And nobody really knows if he was born in November. All right, so we're not necessarily talking November 1303. In fact, we're going to see in the next clause that we're probably using the Bible's fiscal year for Jews of the sacred year, which runs from the vernal equinox to the next vernal equinox. And he dies 10 days after the vernal equinox begins on the same day that Christ was arrested. This is kind of important to know. All right. So we're looking at right in the up in the in the right hand corner, third from the third from the um, last, twelve seventy three plus thirty equals thirteen o three, or thirteen o four. Probably the Bible's going to use thirteen o four, if of March fiscal. All right, for this guy, some kind of changeover. He's the changeover guy. We know that from Acre, the year of his birth. And now it's a question of what is that changeover? Well, we're being told the character of it is going to be like the flood. But his first 15, 16 years are relatively calm. It's when he's 15, 16 that something bad starts to happen. What is that? Well, we're going to find out. I don't know right now. I'm just telling you this is what the text is saying. And then you have to go look at the actual history to find out what it's talking about. See, this is very precise. And when you when you add it up to the history, you go look at the history. And when it keeps on being right over and over and over and over again, then you start to say, wait a minute. There's really a God here. Because only God can, like, satirize time. He's satirizing the future. He is satirizing Ivan Moneybags because of the kind of thing that's going to happen under this guy. All right? So his life starts out being marked. His birth is marked with Akri until this guy. Everything was normal. And this guy's whole first 15, 16 years is like the hiatus between normal and bad and in 1303 AD it goes from warning to okay floods beginning now all right and that's going to be the next verse 39 okay verse 39a reads and they didn't know until the cataclysm the flood came all right they didn't know that it was going to happen. They had no idea. Doesn't matter what Noah warned them. Doesn't matter the streams of animals coming for 120 years. It might as well have been nothing. They didn't listen to him, in other words. They didn't pay attention to the facts. All right? So Christ is saying at the beginning of Matthew 24, 39, which is 1304 in our timeline, and until, and, and they didn't know, uk means didn't, um, agnosan means no, eush is another word for until, elten came, ho cataclysmos, cataclysmos, um, cataclysmos, 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 I think that it's cataclysmos. But you go down in your voice at, at the last syllable. Cataclysm means the cataclysm. That's where we get English cataclysm. Cataclysm is talking about the flood. Okay. And took them all away. Kai, Aiden, Apantas. Took them all away. Until the flood. In other words, they didn't believe anything until the flood would actually hit them. Physically hit their bodies. And took them away. They didn't understand. Now, I'm going to do a sidetrack here. A lot of people say God is cruel and bad because he does stuff like this. What can you do to make Trump wake up and smell the coffee? Answer is nothing. Okay? So, finally, at some point, the infection is so bad, you just got to kill him. 
And the example being given here in the text is that what's going to happen in this period from 1304 until 1322, all right, in the beginning of verse 39, that people are so freaking stupid, the signs are all about them, that everything's going wrong. And they're not, they're, they're like deer in the headlights with this. Okay? They didn't know until the flood actually hits them and takes them all away. What kind of flood is that for Russia? Well, preview of coming attractions. He's the guy that basically does, he, he's like the, he, he's like a one man flood. It's basically it. He's a really bad ruler. He's lauded by history because he united Russia. Well, that's not really true, what he did. He just killed enough people so that the remaining people gave in. That's how bad it was. He's like a one-man wrecking ball, a one-man flood, starting at age 16 somehow. We don't know how. I have to look up the history. Okay, but that's what this is saying. Until... 1322. 1292 plus 30 is 1322. Okay, until the flood came and took them all away. That's Matthew 24, 39a, first clause. Until the flood came and took them all away. In other words, until the actual flood hits them, they got no clue. Even though the evidence is all around them. That's how it is with people. And we're looking at the Trump people and say, how can they not know this guy is bad? Yeah, well, how could the Germans not know Hitler was bad? And of course, those of us who are Christians say, how can the atheists not know God? And the atheist is looking at us and saying, how can you think there is a God? Partly because of verses like this. They say God just wipes them out. Until God literally wipes them out, they have no clue. They're not paying attention. They're saying no. They're plugging their ears and saying la, 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 as loud as they can. So what do you do? To avoid infecting the rest of the human race, you take them out. Now, this really matters to know this because similar language is being used for our time later in Matthew, in Matthew 25, 12 in particular. So this history for Russia's past applied to a specific guy, Ivan Danilovich Kalida, applied to him. This same thing is happening to us now. And then you can turn around and say, okay, brain out, but you know, how do you know it's really him? You're saying I can apply this to any country and you're taking his birth and his death, I haven't got to the death part yet, and, and saying, well, see, this is him. Well, aren't you reading that into the text? Not exactly, but it's a good question. You should ask questions like that. How do you know that I'm not reading it into the text? How do I know for sure we're talking about Ukraine and Russia? And I'll cover that in the next increment. We're back again. Now we're at Rus 4. As you can see, we're still in Matthew 24, and we're still going through the methodology of how to detect the meaning of a Bible prophecy. In this particular case, we're looking at Ivan Kalita, born 1288, dies 1340, and we're just looking to see if the text is really depicting his life, because the text on its own seems kind of generic. And what I have to explain to you is how to use the text. It's not really generic, but it's a line of text that applies in the same way to many different targets. So God is basically telling you, hi, this given period of history that this line of text illustrates is telling you the history of the world at that time. And then you take that text and you apply it to given countries to find out how true it is for those countries. 
Now, what countries do you apply it to? Well, this is a talk. This is about believers. So you apply it to countries where you know there are a fair number of believers. That does not mean that the countries without those believers are less important. It does mean that the history is turning on the countries where those believers are located. Therefore, it's going to track the rulers of those countries where those believers are located. And it's telling you basically that because the believers in those countries are the way they are, the history is going to turn out the way this text reads. That's the whole point of it. The whole theme of the Bible is the world, the whole universe exists because Christ. Now, because Christ exists, we exist, the whole human race. Any one of us can be in Christ the minute we believe in Christ, which is another way of saying the minute we believe he paid for our sins. Okay, that is takes away the enmity between us and God because he paid the ransom. We didn't consent to his payment. That's why we have to consent once we're born. If you don't consent to his payment on your behalf, you don't get it. And you get the other place instead as your inheritance, which is hell. Now, once you're in hell, you can still get out but that's another topic for another video. The point is, is that Christians determine history because we're in Christ, because all of history exists because Christ, because everything exists because Christ. God wants to see his son reflected everywhere he looks. Otherwise, there's no justification for the universe to exist. Okay, so first there was the angels and then one third of the angels rebelled, and of course, God foreknew all that. Part of the reason they rebelled was because for them, eschatology was that we would exist. And Satan got sick of waiting and a bunch of other problems, and he said, I don't believe you anymore. I think you're playing a game with us. And one third of the angels agreed with him. And it's basically an angelic divorce trial that we're all living through. We were created, first of all, because he was going to do it anyway. Secondly, because now we're the evidence as to why God's decree is fair. Okay? So this annual future history timeline you're looking at on screen is telling you how believers impact history. And then it's tracing how the rulers of those countries, what that those rulers did. So it seems to be a biography of the rulers in each case. But whoever becomes the ruler of a country becomes that ruler then because God appoints him. All right, but he appoints him based on what the people are like. In particular, the believers. All right, so now we come down here again to Matthew twenty four thirty eight. I don't know if you if the screen is as bright to you as it is to me. All right, let's. So all the way at the bottom, lower left hand corner, verse thirty nine is basically depicting the life of. Ivan Kalita, after he becomes the king. Okay, I didn't know that when I made the last increment. I just found it out. Because the the end of verse 38 is 1273. You add 30 to it to get the AD. That's 1303. That's when he becomes a man by Roman custom. Okay. So the start of 13A is, you know, until, and they didn't even know until the flood hit them. All right, which ends at 1292. Add 30 to that, that's 1322. It turns out that's when Kalita starts to rule. Okay, 
So we already know that according to scripture, his birth in the very last clause of Matthew twenty four thirty eight. Let me see if I can. Oh, I this Zoto sucks. They keep they keep sticking that stupid thing in the lower left hand corner. I'm sick to death of it. All right, here we go. See, let's get it even higher. Okay, see the end of verse thirty eight. It says in the Greek, you see the word akri at the very at the very last clause of verse thirty eight. Akri, that's his birth. That's twelve eighty eight A.D. So he's considered an akri person, uh, the person that's between one state of affairs and what's going to become a very bad state of affairs. It the badness starts with him. That's what Akri is basically saying, both with respect to the actual text in the verse and with respect to this guy in his life. And I closed Rust 3 with the statement, how do I know that it's talking about Ivan rather than somebody else? Because Christians weren't only in Ukraine. Okay? And Ukraine is more than just Ukraine. All right? It's Ukraine plus the principalities north of Ukraine. It, it's not, that's not the only place the Christians were. They were all over the place at that point. So how do I know this is talking about him? Okay? Especially since I told you, and I can prove it, that each line of this text is talking about any country in the world at that time. So why am I focusing on him? How do I know I'm supposed to? And this video is going to help you see that. Okay? If we focus on him, we'll do it that way. If we focus on him, Akri is what marks his birth. He's an until person. He's a changeover person. Okay? So at this point, we're not saying what I already know, but I'll pretend I don't know. Why Ivan Kalita? Let's pretend, well, if it were Ivan Kalita that this text is talking about, what would that mean? Because there were a lot of rulers in 1288 in different countries. You should, shouldn't you apply it to 1288 on all the other rulers too? Yeah, you should. Oh, and if the text is apt, then you know God had to write this text because only God would know that future and could write it so cleverly through the mouths of humans to accurately state a future period of time here from 1288 to 1340 A.D.? Only God could do that. You see the wit? It, it would have to be divine to be able to write this this way. You know, because a lot of us, and I, I'm no exception, I look at the Bible and I'm like, why is it worded this way? It's so bizarrely written. Well, this is one of the reasons why. It has to apply across a given, here, across a given period of time, all over the world, and each country individually or people really, not country, each people individually, for that same period of time, it's going to pick something different. But it will still be apt, what it says. So what it's saying is that all over the world, we are in a middling from a good period of time to a bad period of time, from 1288, and this one, Kiboton, ends really at, see, 1273? That's 1303 A.D. So from, from 1288 to 1303 A.D., the world is shifting from a very bad, very good period of time, or a good period of time relatively, to a bad one. And we know that because of what the text says. Until the days that Noah got in the boat. Now you know the story of Noah and the flood. So it's before 
that happened. And then verse 39, and they didn't know until the, the flood took them all away. So verse 39 begins at, see, it's 1303. So now we're at 1304 with the Kai there. Go away. Verse 39 begins with Kai, means and in English. Uk didn't. Egnosan, no. Eus, until. Elte, came, really. And the, until the flood came, and then Kai, Aiden, that's from, from Iro to take away. Pa, apantas, everybody. Take them all. Took until the flood came and took them all away. In other words, the flood was sudden, it hit them suddenly, and took them away suddenly. At the end, where this word apantas is located, and where that is located, 1292 plus 30 is 1322. So from 1304 until 1322, the warning signs were out, but nobody listened. They didn't know until the warning ended and the thing that was bad actually occurred. So it's saying that for Ivan Kalita, if we're presuming it's Kalita, and we'll show you how we know in a minute, from his birth until 1322 was a hiatus, an interim period of a shift from a nice time, relatively speaking, to really bad. Well, one of the things I just found out before I started this video, what happened in 1322? Because I was kind of curious. That's pretty marked. It's marking his birth. It's marking his age at, at majority when he becomes a man. And it's marking 1322. Well, what happened in 1303? His dad died, supposed dad. Wasn't really his dad. That's a story we're going to have to get into later. In 1322, what happened then? He began to rule himself. Until then, others were ruling in his name. Okay? Now, the story is a lot more complicated than I make it sound now. Because the Russians have their version of this story, and the Ukrainians have their version of this story, and frankly, the Ukrainian version makes more sense. And we'll get into the actual history later. But just see, look, the Bible really did divide up this guy from Akri at the end of verse 38 at his birth to when his supposed dad dies, Mikhail Denisovich, the, 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 Daniel, when Daniel, his dad died, rather. Um, that's 1303, all right? And that's when he's 15. And Kai, that's 1304, when he turns 16. And, and it's a kind of a toss-up whether we're talking about a fiscal year that starts in March or not. If it starts in March, we're calling it 1304. That's the important thing. Okay, so that right there is showing that until his dad died, things were pretty nice. Once his dad dies... We're in the final warning phase, and still they don't know. That's 13, Matthew 24, 39a is saying, and they didn't know until the flood came and took them all away. And when does the flood do that? 1322, when this boy rises to power. Now, I don't know how true that is. I only know these are the dates at this point. Now, what I'm going to finish saying in this video, which is the purpose of it, is how do I know it's talking about him? All right. Why is he the poster boy for this verse? It's not that it doesn't apply to anybody else. It's that it applies first, second, third, fourth. It applies hierarchically. All right, just like when you get down to Matthew 25, 11, you can even look at it in English. It's talking about the virgins, Christians, calling somebody Lord after the door's been shut on them. The Lord, the real Lord, shut the door on them. 
Okay? Let's see if I can bring it up. Oh. Matthew. Matthew, Matthew, Matthew. 2511. See, you click on this, and that's how you get to the verse. Okay, Matthew 25, 11. This is our time now. All right? Matthew 25, 11, right here, in the, in the middle of the, of the screen. Husteronda, until, or later, really. Later, come back. Hey, loy moi. Loy, loy poi. <laughs> yeah, loy poi. That, that's kind of making fun of them. Parthenoi, the remaining virgins. All right? And they say, you see how it's in green and red? Kyrie, Kyrie, I know exactly, Mom. I mean, God, God, Lord, Lord, open to us. Yeah, because he shut the door. See, in the prior verse? See? It says 1968 there. You add 30, that's 1998. God shut the door. On the politicizing Christians in 1998. Now, what did that mean? Well, it took me about a year to figure that out. Basically, what happens is the Christians shut the door on God and formed the uh, New Apostolic Reformation, which is their way of saying, hi, the Bible doesn't count. We're just going to tell you what God says, and we'll make up whatever we want, and you're going to believe us because you're too damn dumb to live. That's exactly what happened in history. And so, it was predicted. See the word Tura there? Go away. T-H-U-R-A. God shut the door on the wedding. See, we're talking about a wedding with respect to Kalidas. They're giving in marriage. And now we're talking about a wedding supper that God shuts the door on the stupid politicizing Christians who back Donald Trump. And this Kyrie, Kyrie takes place between 2015 and 2018. And they're saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But who are they calling Lord? Donald Trump. And if you haven't been watching the news, you better start. Because that's exactly what they're doing to him now. That's what these Christians have been doing. They've been sending out all these memes showing that God appointed Trump. That's how it started with the Tea Party in 2010. They had somebody in Russia send Trump a tweet saying that God wants, saying he should be a POTUS. And then Steve Bannon and David Bossie got together and went to Trump to recruit him. So that means that Bannon and Bossie were already working with Russia. Trump didn't know, or he already knew. It's a question of when did Trump start being under Putin, all right? In 2011, Liberty University is making a movie on this. A stupid guy named Mark Taylor told everybody that God, he had a vision, that's New Apostolic Reformation from 1988, which is 1968 in the meter there. He had a vision that God wants Trump for POTUS, that God wants that. And so three other fake Christians say the same thing. So when they're saying, Lord, Lord, open to us here in red and green, that's what they're doing. They're basically calling Trump Lord. All right? And, you know, it's all over the news. Trump says he's the chosen one. That's not really what he meant when he said it, but everybody else is treating it that way. The Christians behind him are treating it that way. Lance Wall now calls Trump, Trump the chosen one. All the people on Trinity Broadcasting Network are saying that Trump's the chosen one. That's perfect explanation of this verse, Matthew 25, 11. Oh. I absolutely hate Matthew 25, 11. Here we go. We're back at it. Perfect description of Matthew twenty five eleven in the center of your screen. Go look it up in English or your favorite language translation. See it yourself. It's exactly what's happening now. And this phrase, 
Kyrie Kyrie is 2015 to 2018. Now see how pointed it is? See how obvious and easy it is to know that that verse is about Trump? Okay, well, just as obviously we can know that the verse we were looking at, which was Matthew 24, Sorry. Matthew 24, 38 and 39. Go away. 38 and 39. Now we're back to the text on Ivan Kalita. That's how pointed it is. And you say, well, how do you know it's that pointed? Well, here's why. See this? See the yellow highlighting? Okay, the, the Greek words are Heparosia tu huyo tu antropu. Okay? You see how it's repeated as brackets? Heparosia tu huyo tu antropu. Okay. In English, that means the appearance, meaning the second coming, the appearance of the man, okay, the son of man. The son of man title, you heard that in the Bible. Okay, that's Daniel 7.13. It's the only way that phrase is used anywhere. You can't tell in the English because they screw up the translation. That phrase is only used in Daniel 7.13 in the Old Testament. So when Christ calls himself the Son of Man, he's, he's quoting Matthew, I mean Daniel 7.13 in the Old Testament. Every time. And that yellow text is what Daniel 7.13 is saying. It's not using the word parousia. It's tu huyo tu antropo. Okay? Your pulpits will not admit that. They will not teach that properly. For the most part, some of them do teach it properly. But every time that phrase is used, this is the killer, it's always marking a key historical date in Ukraine or Russian history. Now, why is it doing that? Well, the first thing is, what is this? See, here it is again. Tu huyo tu antropu. All right. That's in verse 30. All right. Then it is again, a second time in verse 30. Again, bookmarks. God, I hate this software. Oh, I'm sorry. Figures. Whenever I'm get, getting to say something important, the software goes m bunko. Okay? So now, see, you got in yellow. Tu huyo tu antropu. Tu huyo tu antropu. That's in verse 30. It begins and ends the verse. There's a Greek name for this kind of phrasing. It's called anaphora. We think of it like a refrain. Okay, so like um, Star Spangled Banner. Okay, oh say can you see the Star Spangled Banner yet wave, blah, 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 blah. That's a refrain. A refrain is a chorus. It's a repeated part of a song. And then you have the first stanza, the second stanza, you know, you, you sing the first part and then you say the chorus, then you sing the second part, then you sing the chorus. Well, like a chorus, or a repeated refrain, that's what anaphora means. And tu huyo tu antropu is an anaphora. You can see it's repeated there in verse 30, and then it comes repeated again in verse 37, and it's repeated again in verse 39. So there is a repeated phenomenon characterized by this refrain that repeats during the timeline for verse 30, repeats again in verse 37, repeats again in verse 39. So what is it repeating and for what countries? All right, that's the question to solve. Well, when did it start? Well, it started, see, 
these are the anaphora. There are hundreds of them in the Bible and dozens of them in Matthew. So the first use of huiotuanthropu with the word parousia is in verse 3. See? You got parousia. Right here in verse 3, fourth clause. See? Keyword theme, map. So it's telling you the entire prophecy is about the appearance, the coming of Christ. Now, you have to know something about Christian um, denominations to get how important this is. The parousia is a very important keyword in Orthodox Christianity. Everybody's waiting for the parousia of Christ, for the return. Okay? It's not a normal word, appearance. And it certainly doesn't have anything to do with the English word appearance. In English word appearance, it's what do you look like? It's talking about literally arriving. It's an arrival. Okay? So one minute there's nothing. The next minute suddenly appears. Arrives. It's a really important word in Orthodox Christianity. Parousia. Well, we're talking about Orthodox Christianity when we're talking about Russia. There's Greek Orthodox versus Roman Catholic. They're not the same. They have a lot of similar characteristics, but they're not the same. So your first big hint that this applies to Russia is the fact that the Bible is using a key word, which in our time is key to Greek and Russian Orthodox. It's like one of the biggest words in their denominations. The appearance, the coming. Another, it's a nickname for what we call the coming of Christ. They call the appearance, the arrival. All right? Now that just happens to be what this verse 3 is talking about. Okay? The, the, the disciples in verse 3, if you look at Matthew 24, 3, the disciples go up to Christ and say, what will be the sign of your appearance, of your arrival, of your coming back? In other words, they're, because they're Jewish and everything in Judaism was preceded by a sign, they want to know what's the sign of Christ's second return. They know he's going to die on the cross for their sins. He's going to go up to heaven and he's going to come back. They're looking, they're asking him, Samayon here, it's outlined in, in green in verse 3, Samai, or, or really teal. Samayon means sign. Okay, everybody's looking for a sign from heaven. What's the sign from heaven of your return, that you're about to return? Okay? Parousia means about to arrive, about to appear. All right? So those disciples are asking Christ, while he's still on earth, that question. And all throughout the chapter, therefore, every time you see this word, or you see this word in its whole phrasing, which we're going to get to, it's talking about the same idea. When does God arrive? Well, what constitutes God's arrival? Christ is going to play on that throughout the rest of the two chapters. What, what's my arrival? Does it have to be my physical presence? What about the arrival of my word? God comes to you through his word. Not some flashy thing out of the sky, but his real character and his real thinking arrives into your head from his head through scripture. So parousias to huio to anthropu, the arrival of the Son of Man comes through his word not just through his body. 
And that gets played on for the rest of the text. All right? So what you know, one reason we know it applies to Russia, Ukraine, Russia, um, you can even argue Greece, is that it's orth it's a big deal in Orthodox religion. The second reason we know is because it's about his coming. And how does God come to you? Well, he doesn't necessarily just come to you through his body now, does he? He comes to you through his word. Okay, now what's that? So then we go through the text. I'm now in verse 12. We go through the text. And we see the next time is in Matthew 24, 27. See the yellow highlighting? That's the full the full anaphoric statement. Heparousia to huilto antropo. All right? That is Matthew 24, 27. And what year is that? See the orange? The meter says 833. You add 30 to it, and that's 863. Well, what was the big... See, because it has to be a big deal. It has to be a big deal. So the Word of God came to who? In 863 A.D. That's a very specific question, isn't it? You go to Wikipedia, you go to Google, you search 863 Evangelism. And you easily find out it came to Moravia, which is part of what was then to be called Ukraine territory. Ukraine and Moravia are right next to each other. And because of this, it, it's also famous in history, there, there were two guys, and they, they're very venerated in Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. They're called Cyril and Methodius. They were part of the Greek Empire, Byzantium. Okay? They were called to go to Moravia to evangelize and provide Bibles for the Moravians. But the Moravians weren't just the Moravians. They ended up being what we call Ukraine and Russia. All right? Now, the Ukrainians will tell you that they didn't need Cyril and Methodius, but the Russians did need them. This is where... There's a whole lot of debate about what's the right history at this point. All right? But if you look up just on the, you know, Google, it will tell you the official, but maybe not correct, story that in 863, Cyril and Methodius went to Moravia and they ended up inventing what we call the Cyrillic alphabet, which ends up meaning the Russian language. And the Ukrainians will tell you Russia didn't have a written language. The Ukrainians did, but the Russians didn't. So Cyril and Methodius are basically inventing the Cyrillic alphabet and creating a written language for the Russians, who the Ukrainians will tell you Russian is not the right name to call them because Rus means the Ukrainians. Okay, that's a long story we'll get into later. But that what we call the Russians were really, um, what do you want to call it? Um, Tatars. They were Turkic peoples. And they were living down south of Ukraine. Basically southeast. And they didn't have a written language but they were evangelized. They believed in Christ as a result of Cyril and Methodius going there in 863. Now, that's pretty pointed. It's easy to find. It comes up first. All right? And you say, okay, well, that's one instance. You got this yellow text, and you're basically saying it references Ukraine and Russia because of this one thing? Uh, no. 
It does reference this one thing, but it keeps on referencing key dates in Ukrainian and Russian history from this point forward. Every single time this phrase, he parousia to huyo to anthropu, or part of it, turns up in the text, it ends up being an important date in either Ukrainian or Russian history that you can just Google and see it. And it always relates to evangelism. That's pretty specific. That's pretty, you know, pointed. If it's doing it over and over and over for the same geographical area, for the same people with the same goal, the same meaning, the same intent, and, and it ties to key dates in their history by their standards, what are key dates? Then it's deliberate by God in this text. That's a fair conclusion, right? I'll leave you to ponder that. But just go look, because you'll have the, I'm going to give you the link to this text. Just go look at all these verses that use this phrase, and you can do that simply by clicking on, see here at the top, all of the anaphora that I found so far. Go away, Zoto. All the anaphora I've found so far, I link so that you can go straight to the verses. So you see the word parousia in the middle here? Parousia, verse 3, 27, 30, 30, 37, 39. See how many times it occurs? Every time it occurs is a key date in your Ukrainian or Russian history. And I have to say Ukrainian or Russian because the Russians basically take Ukrainian history and say it's not Ukraine's, it's Russia's. That's one of the big problems we have today. That's why Russia is trying to take over Ukraine again today. That's what Russia has always tried to do. The very word Russia is not Russian. It's Ukrainian. So they are trying to say that they are the substitute, that the Ukrainians are not real, it's the Russians. That's like saying, who's a true Jew? Who are the Jews? Okay, a lot of people say that the Jews today are not Jews, that that somebody in Scotland or somebody in some other country are the true Jews. Well, the same argument is going on between Russia and Ukraine. There's so many parallels between Ukraine and Israel, it's not funny. So then when you find out that every single one of these parousia verses is referencing a key date in Ukrainian history that Russia is calling its own history, then that has to be deliberate, correct? I'll let you ponder that. You can see how you can search the verses. The link will be in the video description on how you can download this Matthew 25, 24, 25 PDF and, and see it for yourself. It has a lot of links in these shaded areas. Okay. It has a lot of links to external history. So you can test everything I'm saying because I don't want you to believe me. I want you to believe the text. And if I'm making a mistake, you'll know how to do it yourself and fix whatever mistakes I make because I'm going to die soon, honey. And who's God going to hire to replace me? I don't know. Maybe you. So, I'll come back later. But meanwhile, look for this yellow. And you'll be able to download this document. And play with it. Okay? Hi. We're back again. I'm going to do several types of recording for this Rush 4 episode on Ukraine in... Bible prophecy because I'm not sure what's the best way to explain this. It's kind of a complicated topic because the scholars don't know anything about it so I have to explain everything from scratch and there's nobody else you can compare to. Alright? So I have to just give you all the information and then you have to use 1 John 1 9 even to listen to it and then you have to go to God because I'm not a teacher, you cannot rely on me. But 
it's right for you to listen because this is something that the scholars don't know and you can verify it in the Word of God. All right, if I couldn't do that myself, I wouldn't have, what do you want to call it, the justification for saying all this to you. All right, I am a witness, not a teacher. No woman is ever a teacher of the Word of God. But every woman, just like every man, child, whatever, is a witness to whatever portion of the word that person is given. All right, I've been given the meter. No one else in Christendom right now has this except through me. I hate being alone in this. That's why I'm trying to, as it were, explain it so that you can see it for yourself, and then hopefully God will hire somebody with the right credentials to talk about it. And I'm dying now, so it's appropriate, you know what I'm saying, that somebody should, that God should hire somebody now. Enough of the introduction. Now I'm going to show you how do we know that math here, Matthew 24, 25, down here at verses 38 and 39, I'll just enlarge it so you can see it on screen. It's in Greek, but I'll explain it. How do we know that these two verses, 38 and 39, are talking about Ivan Kalita? Wouldn't God be talking about everybody? You know, this is, this is prophecy. It's global. It affects everybody. Yeah, that's true. But he also targets, highlights certain persons, or groups in every single word of the prophecy. Sometimes it's, you know, if you've seen my series on Matthew 24, you'll notice that when we started it, the targeting was on Roman emperors, okay? As the world and Christians moved around, because it's always tracking Christians, as the world moves around and the Christians move around, it goes to different parts of the world. Nobody is inferior because they're not mentioned. If anything, you should be glad if somebody's not mentioned. So far, the only complimentary mention of Christians has been England during the English Reformation. Now, you'll find all that in the Matthew 24 series, okay? Now we're focusing on, well, how does it cover Ukraine? Because no matter what country you're in, these words really do apply to your country at different points. If you're in China, it's all applicable to China. But you have to really know Chinese history very well, and you have to understand the Greek style of literature to see how and what it's targeting in China. All right? But even so, like we got, what, 192 countries now? Okay? There are certain countries that are highlighted on any given day, and the others are not mentioned. Okay, that doesn't mean that they're not important. It doesn't mean that the words are not applicable. It means that there's somebody being highlighted that year, okay, because this is one syllable per year. All right, so now we're going to answer the question, how do I know that this one syllable per year is highlighting above all the other countries in the section. How do I know it's highlighting Ukraine? And I went to the wrong page. Ah, let's go back to where we're supposed to be. Go away, page marker. I can't stand Soto. They, 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 they always make the navigation crappy. And you can't really edit with their stuff because they don't really give you a way to save it. Okay, so here we go. 38 and 39. I'm telling you, but you haven't proved it yet, that 38 and 39 primarily first is targeting Ivan Kalita as it were the poster boy of the entire period, okay, that it maps. And that period is starting in the fourth the fourth clause of verse 38, which says, Acre, es, gemeras, es elten, no, es, ten, kiboton, in my terrible, terrible Greek, okay? 
That means until the days Noah got in the boat. In other words, it's talking about everybody just above that line. Everybody's whining and dining and marrying and giving in marriage, having a good old time, a normal life, just like we were before the coronavirus. Well, semi-normal. If you take Trump away and go back before Trump and before the stupid Seven Mountains people, we were having a normal life. They wrecked it. Okay? We didn't know that they were there. They We didn't hear from them. Okay? And then all of a sudden, they're front and center. That's kind of what Christ is talking about here. Okay? So that fourth line in Matthew 24, 38, here on screen, I'll, I'll enlarge it. Okay? You see A... X-R-I in, in the lower left corner. That means until. You pronounce it Akri. Hes, Hemeras, Eiselten, Eiselten. No, Es, Ten, Kiboton. All right? Until the days when Noah got in a boat. Literally means came into. All right? So they were having a good old normal life until, in other words, there was no warning as far as they were concerned. The 120 years of migrating animals to his ark, they just laughed at that. They laughed it off. As far as they were concerned, him building the ark didn't mean anything. It was not assigned to them, even though it was. And the 120 years of migrating animals didn't mean anything to them either until the day he got in the boat because no clouds, no rain, abnormal amount of nothing started until the day he got in the boat. So for 120 years, he spent, you know, hewing the cypress wood, making the pitch and all that stuff to the specifications, God said. And people started looking at him during the 120 years and they started laughing, just like atheists laugh at us Christians today. Okay? Only back then, Noah was a mature believer. He wasn't an idiot like we Christians typically are. So people didn't really have justification for laughing at him. All right? They were laughing for 120 freaking years. He built a boat that's big enough to take, you know, half the human race or at least one tenth of a human race. Didn't have to be the animals. The people could have lived off the fish in the ocean. But instead of doing that, they laughed. So the animals that migrated during all that time were smarter than the humans. Okay? So they're just marrying and giving in marriage until, again, we read the sentence, Acrites hemeras eselten no es ton kiboton, ten kiboton. Until the day Noah got in the boat, there was no, as far as they were concerned, there was no evidence of God, no evidence that the judgment supposedly of God that Noah had to announce for 120 years, as far as they were concerned, it was all bupkis. It was all a big laugh. All right? That period, okay, that fourth clause, 38, we'll call it 38D. That's the period from when our boy Ivan Kalita is born until the alleged his alleged father dies at Kiboton at the end of this phrase. His father dies. Okay, that's your first piece of evidence that it's about Ivan Kalita. Because that's really specific. It's it's starting when he's born and it's ending. Excuse me. It's ending at the word kiboton. Go away. Oh, I hate this. I got I gotta get something other than Soto because it just it it's just like unbelievably hard to manage. It keeps putting up these stupid little things in the lower left hand corner, making it really hard for you to navigate and 
interferes with your your moving stuff. Okay, there we go. So to key both on in the in the um, third from the bottom, rightmost corner word is it looks like a K I B Omega T Omicron N key both on. Okay, it's saying key both on, but that's wrong. You never stress Greek on the last syllable. That's a pasting error for the Greek letters. Okay, kiboton is how you should pronounce it. All right, so until the day that Noah got in the boat. So until the day that Noah got in the boat characterizes from when Ivan Kalita is born until the day his alleged father, Daniel, dies. And you say, well, yeah, but how do you know that that's the way that it should parse because when you look at the years that this covers this text covers those are the years it covers that's pretty apt okay because when daniel dies all hell breaks loose for ukraine i haven't gotten to that part yet but that's what happens the second piece of information that makes it obvious not yet conclusive, just like, oh, I need to work on this, is the clause in the beginning of 39 where it says, Kai uk egnosan eus elten ho kataklusmos kai eren apantas. Okay? Which, roughly translated, if I can get rid of the stupid Xodo thing, says, and they didn't even know, meaning the people who were laughing at Noah. And they didn't even know until the cataclysm, the flood, came upon them. The chai there is a sense of, it means even, even, it's like in fact. It's, it's, you could call it emphatic or sensitive, which means that it's, they didn't even know until the flood hit them. Okay? So in spite of all the Noah building for 120 years, in spite of the 120 years of migration, they were laughing their head off because he's building this boat on dry land and there's no water for miles around. He was a laughing stock for 120 years. So when he gets in the boat, there's no indication of bad weather until he gets in the boat. And even once he gets in the boat and once the rain starts, they still didn't believe it until the flood literally, if I could just get the Odo to stop this. Damn, this is a bad program. Oh, I got to find myself another PDF viewer. It used to be good, but they've, like everybody else, they wreck it with all their so-called improvements. Okay? Okay, back to 39A. And they didn't even know until the flood, and this is Aden Apantas. Aden Apantas means took them all away. In other words, they're busy laughing their head off, and the rain starts. I mean, think about this. Close your eyes and just think about this. They're laughing at Noah. He gets in the boat. As far as they're concerned, it's still dry land. Then a cloud appears and a little rain starts. And they start, they're still laughing. Oh, there's your rain. Only it's one cloud and a few drops. Kind of like the coronavirus. Then another cloud. Ha oh, ha ha ha. More clouds, more rain. Ha ha ha. And more clouds and more rain, and more clouds, and more rain, and then they're starting to get drenched, and they're still so busy laughing because they're not believing what's happening to them. Until it's like a flood up to their neck. And when you got that much water, then it starts to act like an ocean, and it literally carries you off, okay? So they didn't believe it, what, believe it until it rose to the level of a flood and carried them away. That was when they believed it. Now, of course, the question you could ask is, did they believe in God at that point and get saved? Probably. Wouldn't you? Oh, my God, I was wrong. I'm wrong, God. I'm wrong, God. Save me. 
Well, it's too late to save you physically, but it's not too late to save you for eternity. In other words, you won't believe it until you get hit. That's the way it's going to be with the coronavirus, too. A lot of the people who are behind Trump, they will not believe how much they have been duped, how much they have refused to listen to the truth until they get hit. And you say, well, but brain out, you're applying this to today, not to Ivan Kalita. Well, but that's the point of the prophecy, is that it's always giving you parallels in history. Okay, this is technically speaking, text about the flood. But if you go back to verse 38, this is what it's going to be like in the last days. Okay, but what are the last days? Well, there are different kinds of last days. That's where the parallelism comes in. The last days of your life, the last days before judgment hits you, the last days of somebody else's life, the last day when judgment hits them, the last days of a nation's life, the last day of the, the, the uh, Republican Party, because that's coming. The last days of Trump. You see, see, there are lots of people in groups, and for somebody, it's always getting up onto the last days. What is really sad about Christians is when they hear of the words, the last days, they're solely thinking about the last seven years of history, okay? That the Bible says there really are going to be a last seven years of history, as we know it, okay, before Christ returns. That's true, but there are other parallels in history long before that. And that's what Christ is explaining here, the other parallels. Okay, they're drinking and eating and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah got in the boat. Okay, so what's the equivalent now to Noah getting in the boat? Well, I think you could argue the coronavirus. Okay, we're seeing the first few droplets of cases, which are very clearly linked to China. Okay, because everybody who got it in the United States got it through contact with somebody who had contact with somebody from China. That is not to blame China. All right? That is just path tracing the pathogen. Okay? And the pathogen tends to come from China. Not because China is bad, but because of the way the weather works and because of the way animals migrate and because of the way disease migrates. Disease has always migrated that way. Disease in the in Europe, okay, has always come from China. Always. That's not the only place it comes from, but it has always come from China for the last 2,000 years. Okay, that's not to blame China. China didn't invent its, you know, landscape. You see what I'm saying? This is coming from God. So just understand that what we're going through is coming from God, just as he's explaining now. Nobody believed it when the flood came. Noah's sitting there on the Anatolian plateau building a boat for 120 years. They didn't believe anything until, even when the rain came, until it was up to their necks and they're drowning. Only once the flood Flood, that means it has to be like up to their necks and carrying them away because of the volume of water. Until the flood carried them away, they didn't believe it. That's the way we are, okay? But as I started to say at the beginning, and I keep getting sidetracked, this whole period until the days that Noah got in the boat is the childhood of Ivan Kalita. And then the next phrase, you know, a stupid program is always making me have to stop. Until, it's verse 39, lower left-hand corner. And they didn't even know till the flood hit them. All right. So at Kiboton, that's the death of the guy, Ivan Kalita's supposed dad. It's not really his dad. We'll get into that. Okay. The second clause that covers his life, and that's again why we know it's Ivan Kalita, 
is that when his dad dies, the next clause, verse 39a, see, 39a. Here's 39, where it says Kai Uk, right next to the 39. All right, that we're calling 39a. That whole clause to apantas at the end. Apatak. Yeah, apantas. It's not accident on the last syllable. It's the second to last syllable. That's a Greek pasting error. Okay. Until he carried them all away. That carried them all away is 1322, when our boy Kalita starts to rule in his own name. And it's like, whoa. So it's benchmarking the clauses, and you have to break it by clause, because that's how Greek poetry works. They create clauses, okay? And this is in Greek, so you have to follow Greek literature rules, okay? It's Hebrew meter, but it's Greek literature written to Greeks in Greek, and they're expecting clauses, all right? So you parse the, the words in the clauses. They didn't use verse numbers like we do. We invented that in the 1100s in the College of Paris, okay? So, but for the Greek reader, the Greek is going to break it at the clause. Ugh, stupid, stupid, damn program. I've got to find somebody else. I've got to find another PDF reader. This has just got the worst navigation possible. All right. The Greeks are going to expect to be have the text broken in clauses. So apantas is equivalent to 1322. See? If you can look at the lower left-hand corner, see that 1292? You always have to add 30. That's 1322 A.D. So that's when our boy, Ivan himself, starts to rule in his own name. He's no longer under regents. So you'll notice the first break is when his alleged father dies at Kiboton. The second break is at Apantas when he allegedly, when he starts to rule in his own name. So it's pretty much targeting him from birth to his, you know, these are milestones in a person's life. From birth until your supposed parent's death, and then from their death, you're now regent, you're now under regents, you're technically the ruler of the, of the duchy. And, and then the next break point would be, just like in the text, only this time it's when he starts ruling in his own name, 1322. So those are two really big pieces of evidence that, yes, it's about Ivan Kalita because look how specific it is. All right. Then your third one, third clause, hutas este kai. You have to count that kai. It's it's in a variant, but you have to count it. He parousia. This is the, the number one reason why we know it applies to Kalita. He parousia tu huyo tu antropo. Okay, that's highlighted in... in Yellow and green. All right, this is the number one reason why we know it applies to Ukraine. Okay, and especially here to Kalita. At the end of this, okay, see how it says, Eparosia tu huyo tu antropu. All right, at antropu, that's when he dies. So it is literally mapping his personal life from birth to alleged father's death, to his regency, to his own ruling in his own name, and then to his death, marked with, oh, go away, Exodo. He parousia tu huyo tu antropu. Right there highlighted in yellow. Now that's your number one reason why we know this applies to Ukraine and to Ivan Kalita. And I'll cover more of that in the next increment. Hopefully. I'll stop being so angry. Okay, we're back. And we're still talking about how do I know, how do we prove that the last clause in what we're looking at here is Matthew 24, 38 through the end of Matthew 24, 39, which you see in the lowest line of the screen. In green, Ivan declares self of Vladimir. At hey, how do I know that's talking about Ivan Kalita? 
The first reason I'm trying to explain to you is that the Greek text, the meter of the Greek text, follows a combination of Bible rules all the way from the Old Testament, which has to do with seven factors. And the seven factoring rule is taken into account when you see orange in the numbers here. Okay, it's saying that that in God's plan, an important year is reached when it's orange and it's at the end of a clause. All right, in the Old Testament, it was at the end of a verse. Now, they might be using the, the clause technique also, but I haven't tested it. But for sure, in Greek, because of Greek's literature's history, because remember, Greeks are reading this. Bible is written for an audience. The audience has a way of understanding things. And if you want to communicate to somebody else, you got to first understand their way of understanding things so that you can translate into their language. Okay, here the language is Greek. The Bible was original. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. And one of the ways we know that is because of what we're looking at here, because the text is metered for time just like the Old Testament, using the same rules, except here, your benchmarks are per clause, because that's the way Greek um, meter was done. In other words, Greek meter has its own rules for, you know, non-Bible stuff. So since it's talking to a Greek audience, it's following some of the Greek rules, but to prove that it's from God, it's following the Old Testament um, meter rules. Okay. It sometimes also follows Greek meter rules at the same time. But here, the one rule it's always following is that you divide the text by clause. All right. And that's what I've done. That's why I had to, you know, copy this from Bible works. And the, when it's copying, it, do, it always puts accent on the last syllable, which Greek never does. Something in the copying process is a bug. But when I'm copying each, each, the text, I break the copy in the clauses, you know, because in the original text, and yes, it's original because the words are original, um, they don't break like this. Well, there's one manuscript that does, and I haven't seen it in person, so I can't attest to all of it. But the Biza manuscript does break by clause, especially in Mark, all right? But generally speaking, the, the, the people who wrote the copies of Scripture, they're, they're just copying the letters. They don't even break between words. And all they care about is getting pretty columns. All right? But that's not how the Greek reader read. All right? He read it by clause. Now, granted, when the, it, it was originally written, well, we don't really know, but presumably when it was originally written, it was just one string of letters like we see in other Greek texts for other things. But it might not have been. It might have been originally broken like this. What I do know, and you can prove it yourself by counting the syllables, what I do know is the text, when it breaks, is significant. All right, as we're showing here, with what I'm saying is Ivan Kalita. And the first reason we know it's Ivan Kalita is that the last um, clause in Matthew 24, 38, Ace, Hymeron, Ten, Kiboton, that covers his childhood until his alleged father Daniel dies. I haven't gone into the details of what that period of time was like, but the clause breaks on his personal life that way. And you say, well, that could be a coincidence. Okay, but look at the second one. The next clause that breaks for his life is 39a, kai uk egnosan eus elten ho kataklusmas ke eiren apantas. That whole clause covers from when his alleged dad died and therefore he becomes the next, you know, ruler of the duchy until he actually rules alone. So this clause is covering from 1304 
1322 A.D. Clause in Matthew 24, 39. And we know that because if you look at the 1292 in the lower right-hand corner, in order to get the A.D. equivalent, you always have to add 30 to it because Christ is speaking in 30 A.D. And the Bible is always dates years from something. Years from someone or years from something. So the number of years that have elapsed since Christ said this prophecy at that point, at the end of um, Matthew 24, 39, A, the number of years that have elapsed, which is the number of syllables, is 1292. So 1292 plus 30 is 1322. Okay, well that is a big benchmark in his life as well. All right, that covers from when his alleged dad died until he himself is on the throne himself without any regents. That's a big problem in ancient history. You know, kids coming to the throne and then behind them are their parents or other adults who are really running the show and they get so used to running the show, they don't want the kid to grow up. Okay? They just want to keep him fat, dumb, and happy. That's a major theme of history. So until he comes to throne, that's 12, 13, 22, if you were to look at the history books. So this whole Matthew 24, 39a is covering the time of his supposed minority. In other words, he's 16 years old. When his dad, his supposed dad dies, and he's kept down for the next 18 years, okay, or 19, 19, could be 19th year, all right? He's kept down. So you can imagine coming to power in 1322, he's going to be pretty pissed off. And revenge is going to be a major theme in his mind. Okay, so now this last clause covers him until he's dead. And the text here translated last line in Greek in Matthew 24, 39. Hutas este kai heparousia tu huil tu antropu. Okay, that phrase highlighted in yellow is repeated as you'll see above it. Heparosia tu huyo tu antropu also appears in verse 37b. And it's like, oh, it's repeated like bookmarks, like bookends. And the answer is, yeah, it is. Why is it repeated? And what does that repetition signify? Okay, that's where we're, we sort of left off at the last you know, the last part of four, last part of four A, and now we're in part four B, and it took me again a long time to introduce it. Why are we looking at this? This is supposed to be his own rule without regents. He's on the throne by himself as an adult, and the text that characterizes his rule, I'm, you know, you're still taking my word for it till I've proven it, is that the translation of this text is, thus is the coming of the Son of Man, the arrival. And it, the word parousia in Greek, to Greeks, especially Greek Orthodox, is an extremely important word. It To us, we would call it the second coming. All right? They have a different phrase for it. But parousia to them means arrival. That's literally what it means also. But Christ arrives. Christ arrives on earth. Christ arrives to you. And all throughout this, these two chapters, this phrase, heparosia tu huyo tu antropo, is repeated. As you can see, it was repeated in verse 37. And now it's repeated again in verse 39. And the period it covers is the regency, the sole rulership of Ivan Kalita by himself. And, and in particular, he declares himself 
or is declared, we're going to get into that, a Vladimir beginning at the, what's outlined there in green, hey, hey parousia tu huyo tu antropo, hey is the definite article, the arrival of the Son of Man is a literal translation. Now you have to think outside the box, all right, and Christians never do, and this is why Bible is like a conundrum to them, and boring, and they don't like it, all right. God arrives through what? God arrives to you, obviously, the, the first thing you think of is, oh, Christ coming back in person so I can physically see his body. Yeah, that's an arrival. That's what we call the second coming, all right? But he also arrives to you in your mind. God also arrives to you through, as it were, contact with your mind. When you're reading Bible in particular, and that's what this phrase is primarily used to indicate, when you're getting Bible or reading Bible or hearing about Bible, God is arriving to your mind because it's God's word. The Son of God is the Word of God. So if the Word of God arrives to your mind, that's like the Son of God arriving in a body, because now we're talking about the body of His Word, the body of Scripture, the body of what God says to the whole human race. And Christ starts playing on that way back here in verse 3 because that's what the disciples ask him. See, here's verse three, the last line, second to the last line. It says, and what will be the sign of your arrival? Tes, seis, parousias. Okay? What will be the sign of your arrival? The disciples asked him that question in verse three. Okay? And verse 3 begins by saying, you can look it up in your own Bible. And while he's sitting there in the mountain, all right, um, you know, they come up to him one by one and ask, what will be the sign of your coming? All right, Mount of Olives in particular. What's going to be the sign of your coming? So he plays for the rest of this chapter. He's going to play on that word that you see highlighted in, in yellow. Parousias. Your arrival. What is the sign of your arrival? Well, hello. How about the word of God? How about I get the word of God that I, that I speak to you now in a body? How about if the body of my thinking comes to you? That's even closer than my physical body to you. That's an arrival of God to you in your mind. That's why we're commanded to learn the Bible, to have closeness with God. So throughout this chapter, remember we're still in Matthew 24 and 25, throughout the chapter, every time you see the word parousias or tu huyo tu antropu, the son of man, or just man, or just son, Anytime you see any part of that phrase, okay, he's talking about something arriving to the target. We're going to find out that target is Ukraine or Russia. Something arriving to the target to evangelize or help you learn him better, but primarily evangelization. So arrival of the Son of God the Son of Man, means that some people coming with Bible in the years that the phrase is used. So it means that there's evangelism going on in those years covered by that phrase. Okay, so here in verse 3, with the last the last clause, Kai Tito Semayan Teses Parousias. Okay, what will be the sign of your coming in my badly pronounced Greek? Okay, and what, oh, stop it. 
What year is that? See how it says 138 in Trinity Meter, which I haven't ever covered and told anybody what that is. Okay, you have to add 30. So that's 168 AD. That means massive evangelism happened in 168 AD. Now, where would that be? Well, there's only one place. Okay, in 168 AD, believers were concentrated in the Roman Empire. In 168 AD, we're now talking about Marcus Aurelius. And the evangelization is coming then because Marcus Aurelius was real big on bringing everybody back to the Greek pantheon. He himself was calling himself a philosopher. He was a real jerk, okay, to be honest. History praises him, scholars praise him, but he was a jerk because he had really poor taste in picking people. He was kind of like Trump, okay? He trusted people who flattered him, all right? So he trusted his co-emperor, shouldn't have done that. He trusted his wife, he shouldn't have done that. And above all, he trusted his son, Commodus, and inflicted Commodus on the world. When Commodus was only five years old, Marcus Aurelius makes him a Caesar. So it's not like the movie Gladiator at all. Marcus Aurelius was not a noble person. He flattered himself that he was. And everybody bought into it because he was emperor. And by ass kissing, they could get what they wanted. All right? He was a jerk. So 168, the word of God comes to people. A lot of evangelism happened then. Why? Because in 165, a couple of years before that, there was yet another period of global cooling, like we're really in now, but the UN lies about it. And you know what happens when we're in global cooling? You get plague from China. That's why there was evangelization, because people were dying. And the Greek gods didn't help them. So they were interested in hearing about this God that was being persecuted by Marcus Aurelius. Not persecuted the way Christians say in history. Just, you know, bad-mouthed. The Greek gods are better. The Greek gods are good. blah de blah de blah de blah So what does God do? He sends a plague to prove that Marcus Aurelius was the jerk that he was. And everybody figured that out because the plague at that time was named after him. Not anybody else. Not the Chinese. Their plague was deemed to come from heaven and it was named after him for being a bad guy. And it wasn't just once that it happened. It happened on and off throughout his reign. He reigned until 182. All right, he comes to power in 165, I think it was 165, and that was when um, Antoninus Pius died. And so this 138 is 168, and it was a time of plague during global cooling, like we have now. If we didn't have global cooling now, the Wuhan virus would not have traveled so quickly. It always comes during a time of global cooling. After 165, the next time it comes is in Justinian's time. And Justinian, like Marcus Aurelius, was a crappy ruler. Tried to combine church and state. That's what Marcus Aurelius was trying to do back here in 165. Combining church and state is Revelation 17 harlot. And it just so happens that when rulers like that arise, there's global cooling and plague. Because it was the Justinian plague. That's how it became known in 542 as the Justinian plague. Just as this in 168 is known as the Marcus Aurelius, the Aurelian plague. All right. And then, of course, the most famous one we call the Black Death in 1342. And that was during what you can even Google and find out is during a period called 
the Little Ice Age, a global cooling period that normally starts every 500 years. Yeah, and ours is right on time to be starting in 2100, but before 2100 occurs, there is a transition, which started in 1998, and you can find that out from scientists who actually gave lectures on it. But you won't hear the UN admit them. Because the UN is staffed with Greenpeace activists who are pissed off as hell that all their work is proving to be a lie. So if you want to know about the Wuhan virus, honey, this is what it is. Global cooling brings plague, starting with Marcus Aurelius, and then let's go, let's go to Justinian. Oh, Justinian. Where's Justinian? Oh, Justinian. Oh, oops, I went too far. I'll come back. Here's Justinian. Let's see. Justinian was, let's see, I want to say, he was 520, 27. Or, yeah, that Justinian, Justinian dies in, in, in 565. So see where it says 537, another Trinity meter. That's 567. And Justinian died. Just before Autul. Okay? So he wasn't in his house. Ha ha! Bible always mocks rulers when they die. So you said verse 24, 17. Me kata, kata pato. Me kata pato ere ta ek te soe kas <laughs> Okay. The point is, is that he's, he's out of his house. See, he dies in, in 65, you know, 565. So that's at the end of the word oikos, which is verse 17b. So he's out of his house. So that's, that's how God characterizes his life. Oh, you're dead now. You're out of the house. The word his is after his death. So he ain't there no more. Okay. God is mocking Justinian. In case you didn't notice, that's also very much Greek literature. This kind of subtlety, this pointed, sarcastic subtlety, is very much a feature of Greek literature and Latin, and Latin plays. Okay, both. All right? So if you were a Greek person reading this, you would conclude just what I just said. Oh, so he dies at the end of the word oikias, which means your big mansion. Yeah, your big mansion, but you ain't in it no more. You're dead. So all the goodies that you accumulated in your life, they go to someone else who's just as stupid as you were. And you're dead. You're dead. You're gone. No more. Pushing up the daisies. And everybody's enjoying what you spent your life acquiring. And you didn't get it. See, God's really mocking Justinian. And, 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 the, and why is that? Well, because we had plague. Okay, because we had plague. The Justinian plague is in 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 in, in forty two. So twelve five twenty two plus thirty is five fifty two. So the plague is happening five fifty two. Okay, and before that five fifteen and thirty is five forty five. So the plague, the plague had happened at the end of verse 16 where it says Ice ta hore to the mountain to the mountain yeah you're going to the mountain to get away from the plague people because the plague spreads from person to person you want to get up high and away from humans if you're going to survive so you're running to the mountain honey okay in order to avoid the plague Ace Ta hore, and that hore at the end of it is 545 A.D. Okay, so 545 hore, 45, 44, ta, 43. So that the word ace into is when the plague goes into, get this, into Constantinople. It had started from China, went down to Rome. Belisarius 
was basically the guy who brought it back to Constantinople after he conquered Rome, got rid of Lombardy and all that stuff, and was so proud of himself for having reconquered Western Rome. And then he comes back to Constantinople, which in those days was called New Rome, and he brought the plague with him, all of his troops. And they all had to run in the mountains, but there are no mountains in Constantinople. They're all outside Constantinople. So everybody outside Constantinople had to run to the mountains to get away from the plague, which is right there on the shores of the Black Sea. Okay, you get the joke? Now, I've taken you kind of far away from what I intended to say, which is Parousia. So let's go back there. You see this right up here? If I can open it up more. See? Parousia. Oh, now in the middle of the screen. Okay? We're going to talk about what parousia means again in the next increment. But what I want you to focus on before I turn it off, you see the word parousia now in black. Verse 3, verse 27, verse 30. 30A, 30B, 37, 39. See how, how many verses it's in? That phrase, parousia tu qui o tu antropo, is in verse 3, 27, 30A, 30B, 37, 39, 44, blah, blah, blah. All right? It's repeated. It is a repeated phrase. A repeated phrase has a special Greek name for it called anaphora and it basically means like refrain okay row 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 your boat gently down the stream merrily 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 life is but a dream row 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 your boat that's a refrain it repeats so it's parousia 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 of course i can't come up with a nice Way to say it. Parosia tu huio tu antropu. Parosia tu huio tu antropu. Parosia tu huio. Tu huio tu antropu. Tu huio. See, like that. And you're breaking it up into three parts. Parosia tu huio tu antropu. Parosia, the arrival. Tu huio of the sun. Tu antropu. Of man. So any of those three parts. When it's used over and over in the text, it's called in Greek anaphora, meaning repetition, like a refrain in a song. When you see the text repeated, it's saying, hi, this period of time over the years that this text covers is a repeat of a past period of time, which will also have the same character. Same character? Same character meaning what? And we'll talk about that in the next increment.